Well, thank you very much for having us. Uh, we're excited um, to be here to share this idea with you uh, about a defensive patent license proposal. Um, uh, just to give you uh, a little context, um, this is an idea that Jennifer and I actually have been working on for several years in various different forms. Uh, we have a paper in progress, so hopefully within the next month or so, there'll actually be a sort of published, uh, at least Seth Bon SSRN piece for people to look at, but it's still, we're still sort of we're in the final process of, of pulling it together. So um, uh, the talk today is going to hopefully be oops, relatively uh, short, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. It, this is, we're already on slide two of 10, so we're you know, making progress. Um, but uh, we've given this talk a couple different times, and we found the best way to do it is for only one of us to present the slides, and then we'll both engage in the discussion. Jennifer did it last time, so I'm presenting. It's my turn uh, to sort of go through the proposal. Um, and so here's a roadmap, uh, a little bit about what we're going to talk about today, talk about defensive patenting, why firms do and don't do it, what is our idea for defensive patent license, and how might it help solve uh, at least some patent problems that people have talked about in innovation industries. Um, Can I just break in here for a second I'll to say, um, you should know that your own Mark Lemley um, was one of the people who way back when we first started kicking around the kernel of this idea, um, was involved in helping us think it through and put it together and give us ideas. So he's here in spirit, although I don't see him in the room. <laughs> um, so a little background on defensive patenting. Just to get a read of the room, though, how many people here have some general idea of what defensive patenting is? OK, so a little less than half. So actually, uh, this will be uh, good context. So. Hopefully, do most people here know what a patent is generally? A general idea, sort of, maybe? Yeah, don't worry, students, you won't be quizzed on this. Um, right, so patents is one form of intellectual property, and uh, the, one of the distinctive features of it as a form of intellectual property is that you have to apply for it, and the patent office has to grant it. And it's actually, you know, there are debates about how robust the, the review process is to see if it's novel, to see if it's uh, non-obvious uh, and all these other qualifications, but it is the most robust process we have. It's a lot easier to get trademarks, copyrights you don't even have to apply for unless you want to register them to sue someone and do other things. So patents are supposed to be a sort of robust process that actually costs money and time and things to, to get a patent. There are many different reasons people seek out patents, um, and particularly in the software and IT industries. And, uh, one of them is defensive patenting, right? So one of the way, reasons you might seek out a patent is because you want to exclude your competitors, right? You came up with an idea, you're a startup, there's a big bad company, you want to make sure they're not just going to rip off your technology and do it, um, and because they have economies of scale, do it cheaper, and they have marketing channels already, and they basically put you out of business. So you might want to exclude competition. You might, be, um, you might want to license, like you might be a biotech startup that actually wants to license to pharmaceutical companies or other companies you don't want to make it, you just want to innovate, create it, and then let other people do it so you create these sort of vertical structures or other structures of production. Defensive patents are not about that. Defensive patents are really an idea about deterring other people from suing you. The idea is that if you have patents and they have patents, there's this sort of idea of mutually assured destruction, a sort of you know, stay, uh, a hold off process where uh, everybody agrees it's not a good idea, let's just not sue each other. Um, and so you might gain patents and build a patent portfolio in order to do that. Um, so the idea behind defensive patents is that you're really only, they're really only asserted in response to litigation threats. So if someone threatens you, um, they may not even have sued you yet, but say they're threatening you, you might sort of brandish your patents and say, look, we've got all these. The other thing is they might have sued you, and you might want to settle the case or respond in some way, um, but it's usually in response to litigation threats. In patent-heavy industries, um, where people uh, are fairly well-resourced, what this generally leads to is uh, what we call a cross-licensing detente, right? So I have a thousand patents, you have a thousand patents, maybe we've sued each other, maybe we haven't, but eventually we figure out geez, maybe we should just cross-license everything. Often it's royalty-free, and it's just sort of like, okay, we're cool, right? We're not going to sue each other. In fact, we can't because everything's licensed. Um, it does, however, generally require some level of overlapping technology in order to make sure that you know, there's sort of a mutuality uh, to it in that sense. Um, there's more to be said about the defensive patenting, but as long as you get the general philosophy that this is why patents are being acquired, why they're being used, how they're being used, and the idea is to avoid lawsuits and to kind of let you move, everyone move forward in an industry or an area of technology. So how many people here have ever heard the phrase patent troll? All right. 
Ah, more people know about patent trolls than patents. This is interesting. Uh, so, uh, no, so it's become a phrase, uh, non-practicing entity is another way of saying it uh, for some people. It's this idea that there are people out there that are suing um, and this is a problem in patent law and we'll talk a little bit more about this. But it's also been a particular problem in the context of defensive patenting strategies, right? So if you know everyone in the semiconductor industry has thousands of patents, you all kind of understand that to sue on thousands of patents would just totally bankrupt all the companies and drive everyone crazy, so we're going to cross-license. Here, though, comes along a company that owns a bunch of patents but doesn't make anything. So they sue you with their patents, could even just be one patent, and if they don't make, use, import, sell, or offer for sale, which is the language from the patent statute for what constitutes infringement, you can't countersue them. There's no, there's no defensive move that you would make, right? Um, some people previously referred to them as patent terrorists, uh, which was perhaps not the best terminology, but the idea that, again, they're not a nation state. Like in the world of diplomacy and the national sort of global infrastructure and economy stuff, that if nation states are there, you can work out treaties, you can work out kind of um, you know, uh, defensive uh, initiatives, but if someone is a rogue or sort of non-state actor, it's hard to kind of know how to deal with them. And there was a sense that trolls were like that. And so defensive patenting wasn't really effective. However, as we'll talk about a little later, uh, we actually think that if you can truly, if you can have a true permanently defensive patent, it will have little value to trolls. And so that is one thing that defensive patenting could contribute, and that's one thing we're trying to strive for. So a little bit about why we wanted to work on this project and why we want to publish this paper is that we started to notice that um, you know, a lot of areas of innovation going on, especially in the software and e-commerce and, and sort of ICT world, um, you had, it used to be that only big, well-resourced companies could make software or make hardware or do other things. But of course, startups and open source, free and open source software projects, which is what FOSS is, by the way, free and open source software, um, started to figure out ways to do it as well that they could make software and they could launch services and they could do lots of things, but they weren't defensive patenting and we wanted to know why. So most of this, this is, we didn't do any empirical studies. This is like anecdotal in the sense that our clients would come to us, other people we knew would come to us and we'd be talking to them. We've given this talk and other people from open source projects and startups have talked to us. And they're basically three reasons. One is that um, the current model of defensive patenting, as I mentioned, is sort of a centralized portfolio model. So Microsoft or Google or Apple has the resources financially um, engineering-wise, lawyer-wise, to build up a portfolio because they internalize the cost and the benefits are all inside their company, right? Um, whereas startups often lack the funds, FOSS projects often lack the funds to do that. Also, FOSS projects tend to be decentralized. Um, they can still coordinate, but this kind of coordination, it would require an additional level of, of uh, effort that um, seems to be challenging, especially for reason number two. Reason number two being that there is a lot of cultural and political opposition to software patents, especially in free and open source software and communities. Um, we, uh, but also startups uh, tend to often worry about kind of using patents. And this um, comes from two places. One, that patents in the software space are generally associated with bad actors. Uh, they're sort of often considered anti-competitive, bullying, trolling, like it's not a nice thing to do. It's not pro-innovation, freedom and openness and apple pie. The second is that there was uh, a very, still is a very long sense that, that this is just inappropriate subject matter. There's been a lot of debate about whether software should be patentable. Um, many people have written about it like, like patenting math or laws of nature. Like these are, software is essentially the implementation of a natural law, an algorithm, a mathematical formula, and maybe we shouldn't even have software patents at all. And we'll talk a bit about that later too. And then finally, the third one being trust issues. Um, in the sense of do these patents actually stay defensive? There have been situations where uh, companies have said we're defensive patenting and then later on they say, oh, but wait, there's a competitor and we want to sue them offensively. So even though we sort of said that, we didn't actually mean in all cases defensive. And so there's these trust issues around will the patent stay defensive? And um, one example of this in the copyright realm is uh, anyone's familiar with the long litigation that is still going on actually between SCO and uh, IBM and Novell over the Unix copyrights. A lot of people who contributed to the, the code to those projects um, and to the SCO project, uh, you know, assume this is all for free and open source kind of efforts and then all of a sudden someone took their uh, intellectual property and code and tried to turn it around and use it for a purpose they didn't like. So that trust issue is there as well. All right, so what is the DPL? Um, this is a very rough overview. 
There are lots more details and we can talk about that, but actually we're gonna probably ask you to talk a little bit more about the concerns people have because we wanna hear people's concerns too. But let me just run through this very basic overview. So the idea of the DPL is that it's a standardized distributed license. Um, it's a patent license. Similar distribu distribution model to the general public license, the GPL or Creative Commons licenses in that you sort of draft one, maybe two or three versions, but hopefully just one. And it is the license everyone uses that lowers your transaction costs, and your information costs. It's like once you get to know the license, it doesn't have to be negotiated every single time. It's sort of standardized. If you're a licensor, you have patents, you want to be a licensor, you must offer your entire portfolio. And this is very controversial, and we'll talk about why we think this is a good idea. But every single patent that you have, every single patent you're applying for, you sort of commit across the board that it's all going to go under this license. The license is an automatic license non-exclusive, royalty-free, perpetual worldwide to all DPL users. Now what does that mean? DPL users are essentially your licensor or a licensee. And you'll see that there's a lot of kind of self-referential stuff, but think of it like a network. Um, and everyone's in the network, right? And any patent you have, you have to license to other people in the network, and everyone else in the network has to license their patent to you. So these are what we mean by DPL users. Now here's the trick. The license is irrevocable, which means you, you can't take it back as a licensor unless a licensee sues another DPL user or you offensively. And we define sort of what we mean by offensively. But essentially, as long as you stay defensive, you're fine under number one. If you go on an offensive patent lawsuit binge or even just a single one, then uh, you, your license could be revoked. The second is that you, a licensee stops offering their own patents on the DPL. We have a sort of escape clause, how you get out of the DPL, you're not locked in for life. And if you choose to exercise that escape route, um, then uh, your license becomes revocable as well. So you sue someone offensively or you want to get out of the network, those are the two things. Otherwise, all the licenses you get, you get to keep forever. Now the key here is if you breach, if so if one or two happens, uh, it's optional revocation, not required. In other words, all the licensors could still say, eh, I'm okay, this person was a good actor, I like them, or I don't mind this lawsuit, or whatever. So the option to revoke the DPLs upon one or two is, a, is truly an option, it's not required. Um, you can still license or litigate against any non-DPL party. So if Google is not a member of the DPL network, a non-DPL user, you can sue them, license to them, whatever you want. But of course, if they join the network, and that's an incentive to join the network, then you can't, right? So it sort of creates these two worlds, inside the network and outside. Um, now, if you want to stop offering the DPL, if you want to use this sort of escape route, uh, exit route, um, we're talking about there being appropriate notice. Uh, so you were thinking about six months that you would say, hey, I'm going to stop offering the DPL. And you can do that, but the two things that we talked about are that all the previously issued licenses you've given stay in effect. So if people have taken licenses from you, leaving doesn't negate those licenses. It just means you don't have to offer new people your licenses. And the second is that they all can revoke your license. So leaving does come at a potential cost. Of course, you could renegotiate all those licenses with the particular people you need to and pay the money or do something else if you want. Um, but they have the option then. Okay, licensees. Um, this is sort of just the reciprocal part, uh, which is that if you take a license, you have to forego offensive patent suits against other DPL users. You have to also offer your entire portfolio. And here's another key piece, which is you must agree to bind any subsequent patent holder to the DPL terms via transfer agreement. In other words, you are binding anyone you sell your patents to down for those patents, right? So in other words, you can't just sell it off to a troll or someone else and then they sue everybody. It's like the, the proposition is that you are required to make sure that they abide by the agreement. And we'll talk about that too. Okay. So does the DPL help? Well, this is the question we're exploring. This is our, our sort of proposition our proposal, and this is a lot of what we want to think through with you. Um, we think it helps in the sense that this cost-benefit problem that we talked about, how you have concentrated costs and benefits, um, it might help that via network effects. In other words, the cost of patenting, you know, you have to hire a lawyer, you have to pay fees, can be distributed throughout the network. Um, some people will patent and contribute more than others, but there's a commitment to defense that everyone has, right? 
Um, so some are gonna have to already be patenting for various reasons. Maybe their VCs want them to have patents. Maybe they're gonna go after non-DPL users. Other people who can afford patents and might wanna contribute them might just do this because they think it's a good thing. We've also talked about the possibility of pro bono help. So if someone were to commit to the DPL, like a startup or open source project, we might be able to arrange to get free legal counsel to prosecute their patents for them so the costs are lower. And that's kind of the understanding of everyone's on the same page. Um, all users would benefit from the commitment to defense, right? So everyone in the, ne the network gets all the benefits. And as I mentioned, that the costs of cross-licensing uh, are fairly low in the sense that if you've ever worked with a GPL or CC, there is an initial sort of, you have to get up to speed on it, but once you use it, you kind of know what you're in for and everyone else kind of who uses it hopefully knows what they're in for too and they're sort of, you don't have to renegotiate the licenses every time, they don't change, they're pretty standardized. Um, uh, it helps because for those who are concerned about people outside the network, you still have all of your patent options on the table, and as the network grows, so does the incentive to join. If you imagine 10 patents that are under the DPL, and then 1,000, and then 10,000, and then 100,000, you can see that you know, incentives could grow to join. As to the other concerns that we're, we, we've run across, um, we actually think this could support the cultural norms and political norms we talked about. Um, because it focuses that the intellectual property is being used to promote freedom to innovate, access to knowledge, and protection from legal constraints. Right? In other words, this is not about holding people up, it's not about rent seeking, it's not about exclusion, but it's about trying to enable a certain freedom within the network. Everyone in the network understands they get to use all this technology, um, and that the idea is to prevent patent lawsuits and to allow people to have clear ways forward. Um, in terms of uh, subject matter and whether you should be able to patent software after Bilski v. Capos last summer at the Supreme Court pretty much told us it's going to be hard to get at least a court decision that cuts back on software patenting. Uh, I think that ship has so much sailed or arguments are on the edges about what's too abstract, but fundamentally that's a hard battle to win so that this is actually a way we think going forward of just being real about it and being realistic. Um, also, if you look historically at copyright in the GPL and Creative Commons, um, you see that there were, in fact, objections to software even being copyrightable uh, at certain points in history, especially in the 50s and 60s, and that basically once it became known that yes, copyright will apply to software, these sort of instrumentalist approaches, okay, well, if we're in this world, how can we use it to promote freedom? How can we use it to promote openness? We're hoping that that kind of practical approach might help there. Also, we believe that this does provide a legally binding commitment to defense, um, which would uh, address some of the trust issues, um, and that if you can make patents permanently defensive, it then becomes unattractive to trolls to buy them, at least in the sense that any DPL user who got a license, a troll who buys a patent is bound, is bound by those terms and cannot, any, and anyone they try and sue who already has a free license, let's just say, throw the case out, we have a license, go away, right? So it's against incentive in that sense. So our last slide, and this is where we're going to end up, um, are these are the concerns we've heard so far. Right. So this is far from a perfect proposal. It is not a panacea. It is not going to solve all the problems in, in the patent world. Um, and these are some of the concerns, and we'd love to hear your thoughts, especially about these concerns. We're happy to answer other questions and things. Um, are there insufficient incentives to join? Is this not enough? Um, do we need to think about incentives? Is asking for the whole portfolio too much? Could we have smaller commitments, like say to certain technologies, certain fields, certain standards, or certain other things that people might, I mean, if you look at Creative Commons licenses, there's a non-commercial one, right? There are like ways to parsing it up, or does that get too messy and you just want to have one license? Uh, there were some antitrust concerns, especially you're in Europe, if we want this to be effective worldwide, um, although, again, we think we can handle that. There's a lot of talk about gaming the system, free writing, that people might startup uh, holding company, like the patent trolls do this a lot where they create many, many, many companies and then house them within each other and is there a way to avoid someone kind of getting the benefits but not contributing back? Um, there was a question of do they survive bankruptcy? We're actually pretty certain they do, but um, if you have questions about that, we can talk about it. Some people just objected and say, look, patent thickets are already too bad and you're just gonna add by piling in more patents, that's not helping. Uh, and then if any of you are familiar with the open innovation network model, uh, this is a model that was started by a number of Linux uh, using companies, Novell, Sony, I'm actually forgetting some of the other, Red Hat, where they do take their patents and they uh, contribute them to this separate entity, the Open Innovation Network, and then they sort of trust that entity to kind of do the right thing, um, where that entity then goes around and talks to anyone who seems to be threatening Linux and, uh, you know, sort of tries to make sure they don't, and if they do, then theoretically they would 
attack somehow or counter sue or pressure them or do something like that. So on that note, we're going to end and um, we're open to discussion and thank you all for listening. Yeah. Um, and if you have, so first of all, we really are hoping that we can talk about some of the concerns um, because we've had a couple of conversations uh, that are more general and um, you know, with all those smart heads in this room, it would be great if you guys could push on these a little bit for us. That said though, um, it is a little bit of a complicated idea and people may have questions um, about how it works. So don't be shy about those either. Yes. Oh, Tony, do we need to have the microphone? Oh. So if they're in the group, um, they have a license, so they can take a license to your patent. So that the idea is that they would actually already be licensed and therefore they can't be infringing. So the idea is you offer all of your patents under the license. Anybody else who chooses to offer all of their patents under the license is free to take your license, okay. right? So they're not actually infringing there, they're within their rights. But if someone who hasn't used the DPL is infringing your patent, you're free to go after them with all of the firepower that you've got in your portfolio. Yeah, just to add to that, so um, to go back to the first point, there are lots of reasons to get patents. Um, and so the focus of this, the DPL will not be for everyone, mm -hmm. right? But it'd be for those who would understand that there might be people who would blatantly infringe your patent, but you're willing to give up your remedies to go after them if they make a commitment to defense. In other words, you're prioritizing a commitment to defense over your ability to perhaps sue them for lots of other reasons. So everyone who will be using your patented technology has made a similar commitment and that's valuable to you and to the world you want to exist and the you know, kind of communities you want to be a part of sufficiently that you're willing to give up your other power that you might have from the patents you want. And you might have other incentives as well. Um, you know, again, we were really talking with and focusing on people in the free and open source software community and software startups. And in those spaces, there's a lot of concern about, about patenting generally and a lot of concern about patents that are lurking out there that might sink a startup or harm a FOSS project. So um, they actually might really like to contribute patents in order to get licenses from everybody else and feel as though they don't have to worry about as many patents lurking out there that a troll or someone else might assert against them. Sorry. Actually, Elaine, do you want to? Oh, Elaine will be in charge. Yeah. <laughs> There's someone over here. Uh, so we have a technical question coming from the uh, GPL world that said, where they have this issue of is the license, is the contract, how is it really enforceable? And I was wondering whether this was a consideration here as well and, and how you thought about it. It's a bit of a different world. You know, what if the licensor would actually say, well, I didn't really license anybody in particular, I didn't sign any contract with anybody, why are you, you know, uh, claiming that you have a license and they can sue you mm -hmm. for this? And um, on the uh, old portfolio versus sector dilemma, um, your at least current preference for a full portfolio, has it come from the, the risk that it would be so easy to, to kind of game the system if you put only that, that what some people call junk patents, just to take them in reverse order, is like if you only had to give some part to get access to all the benefits, um, then you could just give sort of your lousy patents and then keep your really powerful ones. Of course, if you did divide things up by sector, um, then I suppose you could say that the DPL, that you would only receive licenses from that sector, right? So there's a way that you could sort of say that the DPL would be sector by sector, like you would only get permission from other people in the same class, but we just felt like then it starts to get really murky and complicated and you have lots of arguments, whereas if it is everything, then it's everything and that kind of makes it simpler. But I mean, maybe something along the lines of a standards arrangement? Mm -hmm. Right, that's when one suggestion, already, yeah, exactly, but maybe you just all agree, because then standards get defined and, yeah. 
But there is this concern about gaming the system um, by using your poor patents. Or the other thing that we've done in the draft license that we've put together um, is be very careful about how we define the entity um, to include affiliates and you know sub companies and things like that because very quickly you're going to get people who will game the system and they'll put their junk in one and they'll put their good stuff in another one and they'll only they'll only have they'll only have the, the entity that owns the junk join or use the DPL. Um, as to the contract versus license question, it's a great question and it's something we kind of have a, a placeholder to talk about in the paper. Um, really in the in in the defensive patent context so far, mostly what we've seen are these pledges, um, which might create an estoppel argument in the future. So IBM says we have these patents, we will not sue on these patents. So if they then try to sue, if you use them for Linux, they then try to sue. Um, that, well, they, they, they contribute to Linux, but any project like that, right? Um, then you could have an argument against it because they've said that it's okay. Um, and so we've kind of gone one step further um, to, to actually say that this is an affirmative license. Um, as it's drafted right now, or as we've been thinking about it right now, it is more of a GPL model. Um, so we're really pulling a lot of the requirements into the right to license the property right to begin with. Um, but I think, you know, we're open to thinking about what is, the, what is the best model for that? And it's something that we're still kind of working out. Yeah, I was yeah. thinking particularly in Europe, where yes. that yeah. extension is particularly working. Yes, and we've had comments from Europeans before, which is very helpful to hear that. But just to add one quick thing about that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, in the context in the United States, um, you know, I think arguably there's a circuit split between the Federal Circuit mm -hmm. and the Ninth Circuit about enforceability and copyright um, uh, for open licenses. And it needs to get reconciled. I think there is a way to reconcile it where it's still there still is copyright enforcement for GPL and other sort of open licenses. Um, I have not actually looked at whether the patent laws would sort of follow the same track. It's um, still this little piece of it. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good point. The thing I'll say though is that um, kind of maybe coming back to your point up there that you made. Um, a lot of this is just about norm setting too, to some degree, about trying to get people to do the right thing in right circumstances. Um, in fact, if I look at what I know of GPL enforcement and other kinds of open enforcement, I mean, occasionally you get a really like nefarious actor, but a lot of times it's just people who didn't realize what's going on. It's like it's just a way to kind of get them set on the right course moving forward. Um, and so I think, again, we're not seeing this as a, a scalpel that is exactly precisioned mm -hmm. to get exactly all the right things that you need, but more of a general normative direction to go in that might encourage people to kind of figure out what camp they're in. You're either in this camp or that camp, um, and then try and move forward in a way that kind of makes it so that there's a general understanding of the right way to behave, and that if you violate that, well, you can get arguments about is it patent infringement or is it a breach of contract or things like that? Hopefully we'll have the right balance, but I think fundamentally you want to avoid that to begin with. Yeah, I mean we want it to be enforceable because we don't want to have this trust problem continue. Um, but as Jason said, it's a little bit of, you know, it, it, it's not, we're not being precise, completely precise. Hi, Yeah, so, um, I mean, Jason, I'm sure, will have some thoughts about this. This, this continues, as, he, as Jason alluded to, um, and, and uh, has a bullet point on the last slide. This continues to be a big question for people, that you're all in or not. Um, and it's a very blunt, it appears to be a very blunt sort of tool. I do think it is rather blunt, um, to, be, to be fair. I um, mean, it doesn't mirror the business world, where we have these very nuanced agreements. Um, however, um, as, as Jason was, was just saying, we are thinking of this as, as a question of whether you are, whether you're in or you're out in general. 
Um, and remember that you're only in with regards to everybody else who's also all in. Everybody puts all their chips in the pot. Um, and within the, that group of people, um, who are all, or companies who are all using the DPL, then everybody is cross-licensed for everything. But for any company that remains outside of the DPL, you're free to sue, to enforce, to enter all kinds of nuanced business agreements, um, unless they also chose to offer you all of their patents into the DPL. I mean, it's, yeah, right, right. Right. I'll just add one thing. So I, your points are well taken. I know we talked about yeah. this before too, but I, I'm really excited that you're here. Um, yeah. No, and that's exactly right. So there are trade-offs um, that I always see about the simplicity of the model, and then of course the nuances are you don't get to address, or the more nuance you make it, the more complicated the model is. And I'm just some of the things that I struggle with come out of what's happened in the GPL and CC world, and I'm not sure exactly what I think the right answer is myself, which is that if you have one license to rule them all, right, sort of idea, then you then then it's like you kind of move forward in that world and people deal with it, but they kind of understand what they're interested in. Um, CC Crib Commons has a limited set of licenses and people always ask them to write more nuanced licenses and they always refuse because then it gets more complicated and then, they'll, then you really have to hire a lawyer. Right, at that point it gets more and more complicated and it gets murky and then it advantages people who maybe have more resources versus people who don't. Right? So there's a trade-off where it's hard to figure out. And what you've seen in a lot of free and open source projects is uh, license mutations. Right? So you do have different licenses and there's just questions of interoperability between licenses and, and it gets really murky and messy. And so I don't, I, I don't have an answer personally um, on that, but I do think that that's part of what we're trying to we we're trying to recognize that tension as well um, between sort of interoperability and simplicity and then nuance and complexity and, and, and getting the most out of the system. The other thing I'll say though is that, I should actually maybe even started this, one of the first times this ever came up for me was when there were companies in Silicon Valley who said they were defensive patent oriented, that they were only patenting for defensive purposes and they primarily said this to their engineers. Their engineers are like, I hate patents. The, the executives in the legal department come back and say, don't worry, we're only doing this defensively. And they're like, they would come and they would, to, where I was, at, I was at EFF at the time, right? And they would say, I don't trust my company, right? I don't trust them. They say this, can we hold their feet to the fire in some way, right? And so there is this part of this, which is about if you make it an on-off switch, which is defensive or not, and defensive, really defensive, like permanently, truly defensive, at least those companies can't say that if they won't commit. If they're like, no, there are going to be times when we want to sue people. Or there are only going to be certain people that we want to be defensive as, but not as anyone else. In some ways, it sort of promotes that conversation and gives a way to kind of be a little more transparent about it. And hey, if companies want to keep their options open, that's fine, but then they have to, that's kind of the answer. The answer is, yeah, we're not willing to put everything in a defensive pool. The other thing is that um, we are, you know, we are, in order to be as simple as possible, we are, we are making decisions um, in favor of different kinds of users or against different kinds of users, not fully, but, a but practically speaking. And one of the things about the all-in model is that um, the companies um, and projects that are most likely to have the lowest barrier to that are probably the startups. Um, whereas if you have a large, complex company that has a bunch of different business models running all at the same time, it's, it's without question a much higher barrier for them to put all of their patents in, under the DPL. Um, but we are imagining um, what, we're imagining, you know, Microsoft, for example, just to pick them out of a hat because they're enormous. Um, way back when, when they were just a small company, they could have made a different decision at that time. Um, and then they can build their business model around it. So, you know, we're definitely maximizing um, our decisions um, from the perspective of those small companies.
Um, we're definitely envisaging that if, if, if it worked, there would certainly be um, competitor values in the DPL, um, and they would be competing based on things other than their patents, because they would have licenses to one another's patents. Um, a former colleague of mine at, at the University of Southern California, Jonathan Barnett, has written a paper about all of the different channels that companies use to differentiate and compete. Um, you know, for example, they, of course, they use business channels and they use trademark and they use trade secrets and they use all these different things. This would be expecting that the companies who chose to do this would be making the decision that those would be the things that they would really be using for competition with it, against the people who are also using the DPL. For their patents, they're only going to use those for people who don't take the DPL. And this is one of those things which um, has had mixed results, I think, in the software copyright context of GPL and other things. but. Essentially, they've all agreed that they won't compete on that code, right? In other words, the common code base and everything that's under the GPL, that, they, that the idea is there that they're competitors who are contributing code that other people, uh, competitors are using their code, right? But there's an understanding of a kind of certain way of competing that doesn't require that to be enforced um, as long as there's a mutual norm. And, and so, right, it's not for everybody. And the idea is that, yeah, well, maybe you compete on other grounds, first move advantage, you know, branding, other things, right? Um, and I, part of this comes from, I think, again, there's still a cultural idea that you can compete without intellectual property being, like, your main weapon. I mean, again, like, it is only as to people who have also made the same commitment normatively, right? If folks are outside and they're competitors, you can do anything you want with them. Just a um, clarification on the scope of the, the last license is, do the portfolio So it includes everything at from the earliest stage at the PTO through continuations and part and, and everything else in order to capture um, all of the patents. So um, absolutely, the decision would the decision to join the DPL um, would be the decision um, to cover everything that you don't know about yet for the foreseeable future. Now you can leave the DPL. Um, Right. We drew the line there, right? Yeah, we drew the line yeah. there. So, so if you want to leave the DPL, right? Let's say you have a super idea. You haven't filed anything. You haven't talked to the patent office. It's trade secret. You think that this is going to be a game changer, and you think that it's actually enough of a game changer that you need to um, you need to back away from the DPL for this. Then you can do that. Um, you have to give everybody else the grace period so that they are able to shuffle things around if they need to. So. Right now we're playing with six months. I mean, I think, you know, it could be six, it could be nine, but six months seemed relatively fair to give people notice, um, but also not keep you from filing this patent um, for too long. Um, after the six months is up, all of the licenses that have already been granted to patents that already existed in some form under the DPL remain in place, but you can go and file your provisional and it won't be covered. I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, we wanted to have some sort of clear things that could be used for enforcement purposes, right? So, you know, the date that you file your provisional or your mm -hmm. application, you know, if it's within the six-month period, that that's going to be it's easy covered. to resolve in a court. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas, you know, when did you first discover this idea? That gets really murky. But the other thing is there's a signaling function to leaving, right? So you, the signaling function to leaving is, hey, everybody, wake up. I might be coming after you and suing you on my new stuff, right? I'm leaving the old stuff back in the DPL, but on the new stuff, you should watch out. So we felt like, again, an imperfect solution, but if we could, there enough of a signaling function, those who want to pay attention will be able to pay attention. There's one actually thing I wanted to mention real quick um, in relation to another question, which was about um, uh, the form of acceptance of a license, of taking a license, right? So this is also something we're trying to sort of figure the right nuance for. Um, the action to get a license on copyright is often uh, downloading and then, uh, you know, modifying or distributing. Like, in other words, there are these sort of acts that happen with the code for the GPL and CC and that kind of stuff. With patents, of course, 
a lot of these things don't aren't standardized of how you would trigger something. So we are actually talking about maybe you do have to sort of send an email and say, hey, I'm taking one of your DPLs, or I'm taking all of them, or I'm doing, you know, like we're trying to figure out the right signaling function there, um, where it's, or, or maybe there is a, maybe there is in that sense a central entity like a nonprofit or something that would track kind of who's in, who's out, and then you, that's who you give your notice to and things. So we don't want to over administrate it, but we do want it to be clear. So again, there's not like this question of who took a license and who didn't. Um, of course, you'd have to then announce that you're taking licenses, but actually I think that's kind of a good thing. I don't think that's too big of a burden, right? Because you're also operators, right? It's like the program. Here. Um, so if I'm a startup and I, and I have taken and then I get acquired by one of these large companies, does the, the portfolio then extend to the entire large company's portfolio or is it still just constrained to mine? It's a great question. So my, my take on it is that um, it, this is what corporate M&A lawyers will figure out, right? <laughs> there are gonna be ways that I think that, um, it, it's, so it's really gonna be tied in a sense to the, participation in the network and who's going to then draw the benefits of that, right? Um, and so if if an entity is separate, but it's been bought, right? I don't think that really triggers too much, but if it's merged or if the broader company wants to take advantage outside of what the smaller company was doing to the network, right? Wants to get the benefits of all those licenses, then that's another issue. Um, what I think the key thing is is that they can't take the benefits without contributing back, right? And so I think we'll be able to, like, I think we're gonna be able to say, look, it really depends on who's getting the benefits of the licenses, right? And again, if, you know, if the larger company is outside the network and they can be sued, I don't think it changes anything. If they try to claim that they're beneficiaries of the DPL, then I think they gotta get back. And so I think that'll get worked out, that's my sort of sense. Yeah, I mean, every, um, someone always, um, ask this question because it's a key, important question. And we have it sort of set up as Jason described it now. I'm, I, personally, we're, we're still talking about this much, but personally I'm still thinking through the gamesmanship possibilities um, with, with, a, with a scenario like that where you can absorb another company um, and not then have to offer all of your patents from the VPL, but if you do have to offer all of your patents from the VPL, that begins to seem like probably too strong medicine. So we've, we've stayed with the, so far with the position that Jason um, has has a, has a laid out, but I think we're still thinking about it. And if you have opinions about it, we'd love to hear them. Well, if, if I'm a startup, I don't need anything at all that, so, that reduces my value right. of, of getting acquired. Right, exactly, of course not. Well, let me push back on that slightly. That is one position that startups take. Um, that may not be the people who want to use the DPL then. Right. Um, the other thing is though that you have the six month notice thing. So what you could say is, okay, we'll give notice and then we'll, those who've already taken licenses are in, but then going forward with our new overlords, you know, we will uh, you know, be able to sue anybody who isn't already taking a license, right? But the other thing is, I mean, I actually have talked to startups who have very strong normative values about their technologies and want to be contributors to say open source communities and things in a startup mode. They don't want to kill their chances of being acquired, but those are trade-offs too, right? And at one point were. I mean, there were, at one point it was this idea that startups who then published their code under the DPL were also hurting their chances of acquisition. And we, so let's not just forget history, as I guess I would say, is that there are strong, if I know anything about engineers and programmers, many of them have strong, passionate feelings about some of this stuff. And so for those folks, having an option on the table, right? But if you're a startup who's like, our number one thing is acquisition, we don't want anything to stand in the way, then I don't think this is necessary for you unless the value of the licenses, of, getting, of knowing you have free licenses and can't get sued by anyone in the network is strong enough that you won't get off the ground without them, right? In other words, if it's like, if there are 10,000 patents here and you want these licenses for free and you want to guarantee you'll never get sued, including when you get acquired um, by any of those patent holders, it could be valuable to you in that context, but it may not be for everyone. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate your presentation. Um, I think you developed it. It's really helpful to know where you think the clients and those of them are. Um, this could be about the industry, it could be about the insurance, the company. I'd like to ask a question about another area where there aren't well established markets for uh, products and services. This is where people are, are poor, et cetera. And 
Tadpoles are considered there and, and explored by principally the uh, pharmaceutical industry. And that has not occurred in other areas. But it's a broad problem about how do you address intellectual property where uh, art is not established. And uh, it'd be interesting in your thoughts uh, if you haven't considered it. Mm -hmm. Um, well, um, you know, as we've as we've said, the idea sort of grew from the the ground up from conversations that we had with these two particular communities. Um, but it's certainly the case that, um, to the extent that patents can be available to be used, um, or the dangers of them can be neutralized for technologies that. Um, for any technology that could reach a community that is otherwise foreclosed from, from having access to it because of the cost. I mean, I think this could certainly be helpful. Um, one, of the mo one of the most obvious connections um, between the DPL um, and the companies that we've, talk we've talked with and um, uh, poor um, users outside of the pharmaceutical context, again, is software. Um, we already have free and open source software um, has made a lot of inroads. Um, particularly in countries um, where you know the government would like to use this, though they would like to encourage this, um, it's less expensive. This would be a way for that software um, to also not be um, as at least as um, uh, vulnerable to patent threats. Um, but we haven't. We've purposely we started talking with these communities, and we are think we've been thinking a lot about software patents. Um, but we've purposely not made it industry specific or technology specific. Um, because we hope that others would find it to be useful more broadly. I don't know, Jason, if you want to say more about that. Yeah, just in the sense that I think the defensive patenting phenomenon <clears throat> for the well-resourced players has been particularly in um, ICT mm -hmm. kind of areas and less in, say, pharmaceuticals and things like that. Um, uh, although, obviously, between generics, it happens, obviously, that they want in. Um, I think some of the efforts around developing countries and, and markets, it, it, it's a question of what norms are you trying to encourage, right? And so, yeah, I mean, I do think that if there was a way that it, you, I mean, so there's sort of humanitarian licenses and other kinds of licenses that people are trying to think about um, in terms of generating freedom to operate in a certain social or market context where you want these things to develop at a certain pace. Um, since this is mostly about a commitment to not enforcement, to, not, to defense in a certain context, I don't know that it maps exactly to those norms because I don't think most US companies are worried about developing uh, companies getting lots of patents uh, and coming after them with the exception of China, right? So China is obviously, but that's a whole other can of worms. But I think if, there was, if there's a sense of like, okay, you're creating a community norm and anyone who buys it applies by that norm and if that can apply to a certain area of the world, I think it could work. Um, but it would depend on the norms you're trying to. I mean, I do, I do, I do think some of the software um, dissemination has, there has been a defensive aspect to the, the concern about using free and open source software versus, versus um, proprietary software. Um, but the other thing about it is that we, the sort of all the things that were going into the pot as we were thinking about this, um, one of them is this, this question about subject matter. Um, and whether the subject matter of software patents generally um, creates knock-on problems or is too broad. Um, and in the pharmaceutical industry, that has been less of a question. So the patent reform debate in Congress, for example, is kind of split between industries who have different concerns. And that makes it a little less obviously um, connected to some of, the, some of the activity that's already happening. But I don't know. I think it could connect to software. Um, do you guys uh, foresee a certain threshold that you think would be necessary to meet for something like this to take off as a practical matter, either um, in numbers of patents or perhaps numbers of companies involved? We're academics. We don't pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> Practicality. Um, no, it's interesting. I mean, so this is something that's really, truly uh, guesswork in my view. I mean, you can look at historical examples like the GPL and Code Commons that I think at a certain time where people were skeptical about what kind of threshold you would need. And I don't know that any of the predictions turned out to be the right answer, right? I think at some point people just felt like, okay, this is now something that exists in the world. And maybe it's a kind of evangelism issue. You need a Stallman, you know, you need a Larry Lessig, you need whoever. Maybe it's a certain kind of 
industry that finds that this is a sweet spot, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, I do think that uh, post Bilski is an opportunity to kind of really tell people that this is where we're at. And I mean, so here's another here's another piece of it though that I guess this is my I agree with the comment about startups. Startups are complicated. I don't think there's going to be huge adoption there. I certainly don't think most large companies are going to do this. I don't think. I think they're already invested in their portfolios in particular ways, and they don't necessarily get all the benefits. But I do think that more and more there's this question of patents and open source, and I do think that people are still nervous. We haven't seen huge battles yet, but we've seen some things. There was bedrock suit, uh, you know, over uh, use of um, some parts of Linux that you know there was a trial in Texas against Google, right? Like five million dollars was a verdict against Google. Wasn't huge, but it was related to open source software they were running, right? So I think that having some way to move forward is important, and if you can galvanize people, they might be in it just as a way to kind of do something. And then the other piece for me, uh, you know, is that there's a ton of innovation happening in a lot of these areas, and how you get recognition for that innovation is really an interesting question to me. And, um, you know, in the GPL context and the CC context, attribution is being key. It's actually maybe even the most important norm that they've taken advantage of. And um, in the patent context, I mean, there is actually something about attribution, about being an inventor, right? About being the person who kind of invented this thing. And when you look at it from the prior art side in patents, like you go find that person and they're like, oh, I did that 10 years ago. And someone else is claiming they invented this. And there's like a little, it's a little fire there, right? And again, I think that that could be something where especially if we do the pro bono stuff or we have resources for uh, those innovators to get recognition, I don't know, I'm, I'm always an optimist. You, you know this about me. Like, I'm way too fine the sky sometimes. Jen knows this too, right? But <laughs> I would like to believe that this could actually be a kind of a nice thing for the historical record and for recognition of the amount of amazing innovation that's happening in this world which is not traditional uh, from an economic model. We're still learning the peer production benefits, but it's a way of, it's a metric, right, that you could start to calculate and start to think about in terms of the economic policy you want to implement um, worldwide even, right? So they're way off topic, I'll stop here and just say this part, which is that there are tons of conversations happening right now about world economic trade and IP policy that are happening uh, through treaties and executive discussions, and bilateral, multilateral agreements, and trying to figure out the right balance. And in, the folks in the proprietary and the well-resourced area have lots of numbers. And when you're a policymaker, numbers make you feel secure, or at least less insecure about policy decisions. And it'd be nice to have some more numbers on the open freedom side. I don't, I mean, I, 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 agree, with, I agree with all of that. Um, the other thing, again, though, is that, you know, as we, as we kind of develop the idea, Again, we realize we, they can't be a panacea. We realize there are limits. We realize there are startups who won't be attracted. We realize there are large companies who won't be attracted to that. But however, um, to the, the way that I, that I, and Jason's exa exactly right, we can't predict it. But you know, the way that I see it possibly growing is that you have some group perhaps tied to a technology um, in the FOSS community or some set of startups, again, perhaps tied to a technology um, within the industry, and they choose to do this. Um, and as that grows, it becomes more attractive to other people. And as Jason was alluding to, it becomes less of a crazy pie in the sky sort of thing, just like the GPL and something that looks more like a strategy that's in your toolbox to use um, in the future. So that's, I kind of see it as a very incremental, um, uh, incremental um, shift. But. Oh, I just, one last thing. Quick. Yeah. Um, which is that uh, the other thing is uh, we've been having some conversations with a lot of DIY communities, mm -hmm. which are really grassroots, right? Like maker fair type things, right? They're also a bunch of innovators, right? And some of them like 3D printing and uh, you know, like the whole one laptop per child stuff was where the, some of this started, right? I mean, there are also a bunch of universities who might be getting behind this in terms of what they want to do or certain people inside universities. And so, yeah, I mean, we want to get the idea out there, have discussions with people, but we do think that there are also communities who could get around a norm of let's let everyone be a maker, right, or DIY kind of stuff. Um, I have a quick question for you. And, uh, I was following some stories on uh, news media, and I found that it's legal to uh, jailbreak an iPhone. But uh, PS3, the, uh, Sony is going behind uh, all of these people. 
So how is this different from ESE and multi -tech? Um, how is this different? I'm sorry, in what regard? Like, so what, would this fix that problem? So, I mean, if I am a hacker, I can uh -huh. hack an iPhone without any problems. But if I am, if I am the same for uh, a PSD machine, and a whole Sony or any other different uh, machine will come behind me. So what is that, what, what's different between PSD and iPhone? So that debate is in a, a different area of law. Um, well, so, you. I'll, I'll just say, so the difference is that um, Sony filed a lawsuit and tried to shut down the jailbreaking of the PS3. Uh, Apple hasn't, right? So, so I should just say that I'm actually not so, so as a legal matter, I don't think there is any difference, really. And in fact, what happened was is that Apple kind of kept changing its software, not really suing people who jailbroke stuff. There was a copyright office determination that, in fact, Individuals who wanted to jailbreak things wouldn't violate the Copyright Act uh, by doing so. When the folks released the keys for the PS3 to jailbreak it, Sony filed a major lawsuit here in the Northern District and named a bunch of people, including one guy named George Hotz, Geo Hot was his sort of tag. And they got, they sued him, they got an injunction, they got a settlement with him. I think if he had defended on the merits, it might have come out differently but he decided to sell the case. And so part of this is signaling, right? Sony's like, we're gonna come after you. Apple really hasn't. So putting that aside though, I think again, part of the thing is that hackers don't have much to defend themselves with except code and sometimes free lawyers, uh, often EFF and other people, right? Um, and you know, one of the options to think about is that, um, and this is where you get to the, the definition of offensive versus defensive, right? Mm -hmm. Is you could see this as a defense mechanism that if, if in fact hackers are often the people innovating, especially in the security field, right? Um, and if they patented uh, their techniques for reverse engineering or interoperability or homebrewing and jailbreaking, that could be quite interesting, right? Um, and now the question is, can you, if you got sued for the, under the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMCA for cracking DRM, could you counter sue with patents and not violate the DPL? At this point, I think the answer is you couldn't because the DPL is only focused on offensive patent suits. But this kind of offensive defensive and trying to create a network defense for people who are sort of individual hackers, makers, whatevers, it certainly is something that could grow out of this idea. Oh, absolutely. Anybody yeah. with yeah. patents yeah. Or, or not even or planning so should, to get patents? Yeah. yeah. Yes. One clarification is, even yeah. if you have no patents, you can also join. You're just making a commitment that if you eventually did go get patents or apply for one, that you would. So you could join. You don't have to ID your patents at the time. Uh, you do have to ID your patents if you. Uh, now, I, I, so we're still writing this part out, but yeah. I think it's when they become public, like if they're published or something. Let's say eighteen months once they're yeah. Or if you have once patents, it's available you have to the to public. Disclose them. Yeah. I mean yeah. everything you everything you have, all your entire portfolio, even as an individual. There are lots of individual inventors. Also I just wanted to ask you this part about blockchain. So what do you think what do you think about that? Happy blockchain. Oh, I love blockchain. Yeah. <laughs> um patent that, I'm, I'm gonna write that down because I So what do you can you say a little more about why that would be in the system? The seller was mm -hmm. the DPL, but the mm -hmm. customers were not. And so I'm wondering what the customer would think of that So the DPL follows the patents um, so far as the patent rights extend. Um, and if the patent rights have been exhausted, then. Yeah, I mean, I think so I think exhaustion, I mean, depending. We're still working out what happened after Quanta versus LG yeah. at the Supreme Court. Yes. Yeah. So this is a very challenging question to answer yeah. because it's all over the map to some degree. But um, uh, I think that if exhaustion ends up in the right place, 
uh, where people who do legitimately purchase stuff where the patentee licensed it to the initial maker of those components or mm -hmm. whatever, then I don't think you end up you having don't. too much of a problem uh, because those people really wouldn't need to rely on the DPL, they would just right. rely on exhaustion. Right, but... but they don't need to rely on the DPL. No, they don't. Yeah. Right. So that's a big thing. Yeah. I, I guess I'm okay with that. Question that goes to some of the mechanics, just to explore um, maybe some pain that could come up from the fact that the DPL isn't tied to technology. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the scenario before Right, that's his scenario. Oh, well, mm -hmm. when you say cover, do you mean do you have licenses? Yeah. When you no. leave, they can so they can be revoked when you leave. They don't have to revoke them, but that's yeah. one of the things you give up by leaving. Yeah. Okay, so they become revocable licenses once you leave the network. Okay, so if you develop a new technology that would otherwise be covered by patents in the DPL when you were there, you may not necessarily be covered once you leave. Right. Exactly. We wanted to make it possible to leave, but not <laughs> easy. Yeah. It's like those frequent flyer programs. If you try and switch, you guys got to start all over. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering what kind of feedback you've had from university licensing on it. I know a lot of times people don't consider them trolls, but they are in many ways a non taxing entity. And the licensing arm has an incentive to make money for the school. And when you count their entire patents, it wouldn't be just software. It would cover chemicals and So we've mostly, we've actually mostly talked with inventors um, more than licensing offices. I think it would be, I think it would be good to talk with licensing offices more. Um, in other conversations I've had with folks in those offices around free and open source software, especially usually other generous licenses, um, there, and, and and you're right, patents are particularly sort of sacred thing, whereas copyrights maybe less so for um, for licensing offices. Um, there has been a diversity of opinion and a diversity of approach. Um, some some um, licensing officers or some licensing offices, you know, feel very strongly that they need to monetize a lot or they want to uh, maintain control. There are others who more, and I don't want to name names, um, but I'm thinking of, of a, a couple in particular who've really taken a broader perspective and thought a lot more about getting the technology into the community sort of by any means possible or by any means that is, is the most, the most um, straightforward way to do it. Um, and for that group of, of thinkers, I think this might be um, a slightly less threatening idea. Now there is the all in part of the model, which you know, might give them pause, um, but they've, they've just had a different, they've had a variety of opinions on, on the other topic. Um, again, patents are kind of a special case. So I'll say two things. One, I think, you know, it saddens me always that the, the idea that universities and by the law and you have yeah. to fund yourself through this kind of thing. I just think it's it's it it should be supplemental, not primary. But putting that aside, um, two things. One, I think if you get faculty buy in, the inventors, what the inventors themselves. Yeah, exactly. faculty buy in. Um, I mean, a lot of this money is public money. Right, they're getting NSF and NIH grants and things, right? It's like, I actually think this comports with the public role of universities in general. But here's the bigger point. And you always have to remember, like, this is what we mean when we say a commitment to defense, right? None of the people who the universities would have to license to uh, would get the benefits of the license unless they made the same commitment. So the question is, who do university tech transfer offices license to, right? Or who do they sue? Who does Wharf sue, right? If they sue a bunch of biotech and pharmaceutical companies or whoever, if those people want to get in the DPL, great. But I, uh, I think it would be really interesting if they did, right? But if Genentech doesn't want to be a DPL member, you can sue them. There's nothing stopping you. So University of California, Stanford, go for it, right? Um, on the other hand, if we want to create a 
you know, we want to fight the anti-commons and we want to create a community where research scientists don't have to pay for every single tool they use on their bench. We want to create a, an environment where people have agreed to allow research to go forward without license fees as long as everyone's committed to non-defense. Maybe that actually ends up saving the university's money too in the end. So again, it's like it's like really keen on the fact that the only people you have to worry about getting your free license are people who will never sue you and who have also made this commitment to a community to also not sue anyone inside the community. You can take one more question. Yeah. <laughs> In the most uh, difficult place to run to, <laughs> where you were. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I know we all objected, and I, I think it's, it's really laudable, and I really would agree that um, that stuff is better than war. But the, I have a bit of concern in the sense that you, you mentioned that they all have to go in, right? So I'm just thinking from, from the other point of view, and that is that whether this requirement will actually reduce the number of um, companies who actually want to go into this MPL. Because mm -hmm. what happens a lot of patents that I want to really contribute, but because I see everything, that means that a few patents are going to hold back, that means it's going to stop a lot of companies from actually contributing. So what happens is that the companies that really will go into this program are those primarily with very few or very few valuable patents. Those with valuable patents will not want to do it. Um, I was just thinking about the um, GPL and stuff like that, but like there's no requirement that, they, that all of them are all this mm -hmm. authorship that you know all the work that he has you know into this GPL life. So I'm just wondering whether that, that that's really a necessary requirement. And the second question I have is really with regards to um, whether this could be done in a different way in this if there are a um, sort of like a um, defensive patent licensing, but it can be a sort of like a defensive disclosure program whereby people just simply you know disclose their patent. Well, so let me start with the second question. Maybe you want to address the first one because of, but uh, I would love a world where disclosure was enough. But there have been many, many, many efforts to try and create a public disclosure program, and it's just not. I have not seen a successful. And so I think that people just assume that Google will help us find everything we need if we search or whatever, right? Or there'll be some library somewhere, or there'll be an archive somewhere, or, and it's just, you don't, I haven't seen that work in terms of disclosure. So I feel like maybe coming back to the attribution point, you know, if there was a sort of positive, creative kind of element of like we're getting this stuff and it has some sort of ex extra value, not just telling the world, but actually kind of making something, I guess I feel like there'd be a little bit more that we could, people had a little more skin in the game and a little more like concerted effort to make it happen, but that's a guess. There's also the willfulness problem um, and you know, the, the fear that companies have um, about finding patents that might, that they then might be infringing um, because of the higher damages available if you're willful. There, there's just various issues um, with, um, with, that makes disclosure sort of a lot weaker um, than it would if it were actually a license. Um, on the on the um, on the why the whole portfolio um, is you know as you thought this is the question that we get the most as you can imagine so I, right this we is, put it second yeah first we, and second actually you yeah. first and second on the answer yeah first for, first and second um, it's clearly um, you know it's clearly the, the sort of the strongest maybe most radical if you want to think of it that way part of the proposal um, and you know questions about why not limit it to technology why not limit it to a standard why not limit it to one business line they're really valid questions um, we've made the decision so far to stick with the whole portfolio again to limit gamesmanship and to give um, entities who would who are considering joining the chance to basically say you know, we're in or we're out, and this is about establishing the norms around these kinds of patents for our industry or for the area that we're working in um, uh, that, you know, that is a sort of a strong norm. Um, but it's absolutely a question that we're getting a lot, and we're, you know, we're still kind of working through. We follow through some of these other options. They haven't yet been satisfying to us, but we hear the question. I think that's about the best I can do. <laughs> well, and I'll just add that, um, I mean, 
being academics, we have a little more freedom to put mm -hmm. ideas out there without having to kind of uh, try and enforce them. And so one of the things is, yeah, I mean, just like with GPL and CC and other things, I mean, if we're hoping to put this idea out there, and if certain people decide they're going to try and do a different type of license yeah. and it does limit, more power to them. I mean, we're not right. going to say you can't do this, right? I, there's some branding issues around what kind of license you would call it, but on, fundamentally, right, you know, experimentation is fine in the sense of maybe there will be people who say I'll only go this far, and if you get, if you get a group of 25, people together, maybe with 10,000 patents, who says, we'll make the commitment, but only if the limitation is X, well then let's talk. Right, I'm more than happy to talk to people ready to commit tomorrow about a more limited commitment. In our, and so in our sort of, the rest of our life in the clinic, we are lawyers. And um, our job is to think very pragmatically, you know, about whatever solution is available at the time. And this is a paper, and we can't stop ourselves from being somewhat pragmatic. Um, Thankfully, I think, um, but but you know, it's also a place for us to basically say this is what we think. If people would sign up for it, this is what we would think we, what would work because it's an academic paper, and then people are very welcome to take that and run with it. Tear it apart. Tear it apart. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Are we done? All right. Thanks so much, everybody.